The Japanese claimed they were unsinkable. In secret, between 1937 and 1942, the Imperial Navy constructed two 72,000-ton super battleships, the Yamato and the Musashi. They were the heaviest battleships ever constructed, and they carried the largest naval guns ever affixed to a warship. Among many other weapons, each ship carried nine 18-inch guns, each capable of firing a 3,200-pound shell over 25 miles. The Japanese expected Yamato and Musashi to take part in the ultimate naval showdown, a battleship versus battleship match against the Americans. In the mind of the Japanese admirals, Yamato and Musashi were the epitome of invincible naval architecture, and for years, they vied with each other to take command of these behemoths, then believed to be the world's only unsinkable warships. On October 24, 1944, Yamato and Musashi were heading for San Bernardino Strait, accompanied by a massive task force under the command of Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita. With him, Kurita had three other battleships, nine cruisers, and 13 destroyers. He intended to complete Operation Shogo-1, the annihilation of the U.S. 6th Army along the shores of Leyte Gulf. But as events unfolded, one of these super battleships, the Musashi, did not arrive. As Kurita's task force entered the Cebuian Sea, U.S. Navy pilots attacked from the skies above, dashing the myth of Musashi's invincibility. By the end of the day, one of Japan's two beloved super battleships was at the bottom of the Cebuian Sea. This is how it happened. That same morning, the U.S. Navy's Third Fleet commenced its aerial scouting operations. Admiral William Halsey already knew that Musashi, Yamato, and their escorts were on their way. The previous day, two Gato-class submarines, USS Darter and USS Dace, had intercepted Kurita's task force in Palo on Passage, sinking two heavy cruisers. Before making his attack, Darter's skipper radioed a contact report, giving Halsey a firm idea of what was coming. Immediately, Halsey deployed his fleet to meet the threat. He spread his task groups out along the eastern shores of the Philippines, ordering them to conduct search missions at first light. Rear Admiral Gerald Bogan's Task Group 38.2, a force of three carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, and 16 destroyers, guarded San Bernardino Strait. This group stood the best chance of finding Corita's fleet. At 6 a.m., one of Bogan's carriers, USS Intrepid, launched 18 scout planes, 12 F-6F Hellcats, and 6 SB-2C Helldivers. Each scouting unit operated in a three-plane team, two fighters and one bomber to each sector. At 7.30, after nearly 90 minutes in the air, the Sector 3 search team, consisting of pilots Lt. Donald Watts, Lt. Junior Grade Charles Amerman, and Lt. Junior Grade Max Adams, caught sight of Corita's task force. After investigating the scene below them, Adams' rear seat gunner, Cornelius Clark, sent out a terse message via Morse code, relaying the sighting report to a fighter pilot, Lt. J.G. Bill Millar, who was halfway between Bogan's task group and the scouts. Millar sent the finished contact report. Thirteen destroyers, four battleships, eight heavy cruisers off the south tip of Mindoro. Course 050, speed 10 to 12 knots. No train or transports. At 8.25, Millar's message made it onto the bridge of Admiral Halsey's flagship, USS New Jersey. Halsey was elated. His carriers were within striking range, and the Japanese would be passing through the placid waters of the Cebuian Sea with little room to maneuver. The weather was perfect. Now was the time to attack. Promptly, Halsey sent a terse message over TBS radio, repeating a phrase he had used two years earlier at the Battle of Santa Cruz. Strike! Repeat. Strike. Immediately, 44 planes from USS Intrepid and USS Cabot scrambled into the air, a mix of F-6F Hellcats, SB-2C Helldivers, and TBM Avengers. Intrepid's group commander, Commander William Ellis, directed the mission, wafting at 16,000 feet, taking advantage of the unspoiled visibility. Ellis's planes flew northwest, skirting Cebu Island. 
They passed over the Baikal Peninsula, and at 1026, they caught sight of Kurita's fleet as it headed northeast through the Tablas Strait. When the American planes appeared, the Japanese ships sent up a hail of anti-aircraft fire. Yamato and Musashi mounted 150 AA guns apiece. Further, both super battleships fired a new weapon, the San Chiquitin, Type 3 Beehive shell, an anti-aircraft round fired from the 18-inch guns. When they exploded, the San Chiquitin shells burst with incredible fury, scattering over 2,800 shrapnel fragments in all directions. In the opening salvo, one Hellcat was blown out of the sky, and soon, two TBM Avengers were also hit, causing the pilots to make emergency landings in the water. But Intrepid's Hell Divers pressed on through the vortex of AA. They reached Musashi and made their dives. In quick succession, four 1,000-pound bombs splashed around the bow, throwing jagged splinters in all directions. The fifth bomb struck Musashi's number one turret, bounced into the air, and then exploded. At first, it seemed as if Musashi had repelled this attack. But then, a few minutes later, two divisions of TBM torpedo bombers dropped their torpedoes. Another TBM was blown out of the sky, killing its entire crew. But Ensign Willard Fletcher's torpedo struck Musashi amidships, causing a boiler room to flood. The mighty ship took on 3,000 tons of water, enlisted five degrees to starboard. The remaining hell divers, three of them, scored near misses on the battleship Nagato. Two TBMs took aim at Yamato and missed, but one torpedo detonated against the stern of the heavy cruiser Miyoko, causing it to fall out of line and head for a safe anchorage under destroyer escort. But the Americans weren't done. At noon, a second wave of planes arrived, another group from USS Intrepid. Once again, the Hell Divers and Avengers concentrated on Musashi. Two more Hell Divers were shot down by AA, but Intrepid's Hell Diver pilots scored two direct hits with their bombs. Six minutes later, nine Avengers closed in and attacked from both sides of the bow, a so called anvil attack. Three torpedoes exploded against the battleship's port side, causing Musashi to list five degrees in the other direction. By the time damage control parties finally leveled the ship with counterflooding, Musashi was down six feet by the bow. From his position aboard Yamato, Kurita ordered his fleet to press on, instructing other ships to slow down so that Musashi could keep up. Thus, the two attacks from Intrepid's air group slowed Kurita's advance, keeping his task force within the Subuyan Sea much longer than expected. This was exactly what the Americans wanted. As the afternoon droned on, more and more American airstrikes arrived. Halsey's fleet had finally repulsed all the land-based air attacks, which freed up more American carriers. At 1.30 p.m., a third wave of American planes arrived, about 30 planes from USS Essex and USS Lexington. Once again, the American pilots concentrated on Musashi. Two more near misses from Hell Divers caused superficial damage, and another torpedo detonated against Musashi's port side. With power flickering, dozens of Japanese sailors below decks became entombed in the behemoth's submerged compartments. At 2.20 p.m., 35 more planes arrived, Hellcats and Hell Divers from Essex, Franklin, and Cabot. 23-year-old dive bomber pilot Lieutenant Junior Grade Irvin Fellner Jr. of Bombing Squadron 13 accompanied this fourth wave. Coming in at 12,000 feet, he saw the disorganized Japanese fleet below. It's hard to convey to anybody what it felt like to be a pilot, knowing that we were going after the Japanese fleet. Understand that all our previous missions to this had been against land targets, and maybe a few barges or transports, but nothing like the warships we were seeing. So we were on a high. We were flying maybe 12,000 feet, and all of a sudden we began to see the little white puffs appear around the clouds. We knew that we had been spotted by the Japanese, which then gave us the option to break radio silence. Pretty soon we heard the signal, tally-ho, and we knew that the fighters and torpedo bombers were going in. I was leading a division of seven planes. I put them into right echelon formation. Then I peeled open my cockpit canopy. 
armed my bomb, armed my guns, and nosed down through the clouds. I'm not sure what altitude I came through the clouds, but the first thing I saw was this tremendous panoply of ships below going in corkscrews. They just looked like a bunch of scattering ants all over the place. Although Musashi still presented a target, Fellner's contingent veered toward Yamato. Signaling his wingmen, Fellner rolled into his dive and plunged downward. Below me was the biggest ship I had ever seen. A monster ship. And within 14 seconds, I dived from 12,000 feet down to 1,000 feet. Time passed very quickly, and the danger was you'd get fixated on the target and forget your altitude. Since this ship was doing a very tight turn, I had to almost corkscrew to keep it in my bomb sight. But all of a sudden, I looked and I was at a thousand feet, and the needle was going down so rapidly. I said, it's time to release. So with the ship more than filling my bomb sight, I pressed the button, which was the pickle for the bomb, and at the same time I pulled the trigger on the stick, which started my 20 millimeter cannon. Then I popped my dive flaps and pulled out, swooping low over the water, as low as I could get, and right ahead of me was another battleship, and this turned out to be the Nagato. I literally leapfrogged over the Nagato. In the meantime, my gunner had taken a picture of the Yamato in the background, and I turned around quickly to take a look. I noticed there was no splash in the water. When you see a splash in the water, you know you've missed. I knew I got a hit, clean as a whistle. Fellner's 1,000-pound armor-piercing bomb penetrated the anchor deck and exploded below the waterline. The next two bombs damaged one of Yamato's turrets. Another blew a hole at the waterline. Still another ripped apart the crew quarters. Yamato took on water and, much like its sister ship, developed a five-degree list. As Yamato recovered from the attack, at 2.55 p.m., a fifth wave of American aircraft, 69 planes from USS Enterprise and USS Franklin, arrived and took over the attack on Musashi. Armed with armor-piercing bombs, Bombing Squadron 20 scored four direct hits atop Musashi's bow. Then, Torpedo Squadron 20's Avengers added three more torpedoes into the same area. Finally, at 325, the Americans delivered the coup de grace. 75 aircraft from Intrepid, Franklin, and Cabot made the day's last attack. 37 planes, about half of the assaulting force, attacked Musashi. The battleship received 13 additional bomb strikes and 11 additional torpedo strikes. Going down by the head, listing 10 degrees, Musashi could not move faster than six knots. During this attack, six more American planes were shot down or forced to ditch, but the battleship's fate was sealed. The damage made it impossible for Musashi to keep up. Reluctantly, Kurita ordered it to stay behind. The remaining ships made it another 30 miles, but Kurita became frustrated when the air fleet's land-based planes failed to show. Kurita did not yet realize that the bulk of them had been shot down earlier that morning, trying to attack Rear Admiral Frederick Sherman's task group. Worried that another American airstrike might come or that U.S. submarines would be prowling San Bernardino Strait, Kurita ordered his task force to turn around. At 4.20 p.m., Kurita's ships returned to Musashi's position. The sight filled them with despair. The bow was down by 26 feet, and seawater swept the forecastle. More problematically, the list had grown worse, and it appeared as if the ship was ready to capsize. For the next three hours, the crew fought hard to keep the ship upright, but it did no good. Vice Admiral Toshihira Inuguchi, who had been wounded during the attack, order his crew to abandon ship. However, Inoguchi himself chose to go down with the wreck. Only 1,376 of Musashi's 2,399-man crew managed to escape. Hundreds had already been killed by the Americans, but hundreds more died when the ship rolled over violently at 7.36 p.m. With the stern jutting high into the air, the ship sank to the bottom of the Sibuyan Sea, 4,400 feet below. Back on USS Franklin, Lieutenant J.G. Fellner celebrated with his shipmates. They knew they had achieved the unachievable. They had sunk a ship 
that had been touted by the enemy as unsinkable. Fellner remembered, I flew back to the ship, and we were all highly elated. There was great euphoria among all the pilots, everybody telling tales. Most of the planes that day attacked the Musashi. It was wounded, badly wounded, by torpedoes early on, so it was going in circles like a wounded tiger. Everybody homed in on it. It was an elephant. Those were gigantic ships, and they had seen only minor action before. This was their first major action. That day, the Masashi took 17 bomb hits and 19 torpedo hits. The only thing I would add is that, in my estimation, Sibuyan Sea was a great engagement, and it certainly would have been by itself if it was not dwarfed by the achievements off Samar the very next day. Fellner's recollection underscored an important point. If the American carrier pilots had not sent Musashi to the bottom of the Sibuyan Sea, Kurita would have arrived at the Battle of Samar with two super battleships, not just one, which might have changed the outcome of that engagement. In persisting in their attempt to sink the unsinkable Musashi, the American carrier pilots had, in effect, changed the outcome of the Battle of Leyte Gulf. <laughs>